The biggest mechanic that we have in Klal Yisrael was Moshe Rabbeinu. He was the leader, and he was the nice and atayra. He was the mechanic of the dar. No greater mechanic. And how did he get his job? So the Medrash tells us that he had a little class of shepsalach, these little sheep. He was a raya. And one of the sheep ran away, ADHD. And he probably had a whole class or a whole school over there. If he was uh, in, in Darche, he would have probably parallel classes going on. A lot, a lot of stuff going on. But what did he do? He stopped what he was doing and he chased down the sheep. When we were kids, when we got chased down, usually you felt a hand on your neck pulling you back to do what you got to do. That's not what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He sees that this sheep is drinking. Remember by the water fountain? If you were drinking at the wrong time when you're supposed to be on the line, it wasn't good. He sees that the sheep has needs, and instead of reprimanding the sheep and complaining and sending him home and looking for a therapist, instead he apologizes to a sheep. He says, Oi, I didn't know. Everybody has drink time, and you are thirsty more than other sheep, and you couldn't wait. I didn't realize. Oye, Fata, you're hungry, you're thirsty. And, and my Shabbat is apologizing to a sheep. And then afterwards, <coughs> he takes the sheep and he carries him on his shoulders, probably not a very Geshmaka thing to do. And he carries him back that the sheep shouldn't even have to walk after he ran away, he shouldn't even have to have consequences, natural consequences of his own actions, because it's not your fault, it's my fault, I should have provided for you. When Hashem saw the way that Moshe Rabbeinu was taking care of sheep, he said, you're going to be the Raya Neman of Klal Yisrael. If you can care about every individual, and not just be busy with the group, and you realize that when somebody misbehaves, even a sheep, that it means that we didn't provide for you, you're the one I want in charge of teaching Torah to Klal Yisrael. <coughs> and for as long as I can remember, at least 15 years that I'm in, in the not chinuch field, and uh, the anti chinuch field, dealing with what I deal with, the one name in Klal Yisrael that pops up consistently as someone who not only builds Meistis to, to a tremendous level, but someone who cares about every single child. I know from, from so many people who tell me, I know from family members how Rav Bender is the one. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, it really is. It really is. Um, it really is chus for me. I, I, this man is doing what nobody else in America is doing, and, and he's really the number one person in the Yanam that you're all here for. And the um, truth is, it took me much too long to come here. And even though I had tough two days of traveling around, literally around the country list two days, and I'm happy to be here. What can I tell you? It's, it's, it's the man is doing what nobody else is doing. I, I, I say it all the time. And, um, and the, the problem the yeshivas have, I want to get to what I want to say in a minute. The problem yeshivas have, we have the same problem we have. We have the so-called, I don't know who's regular, who's not regular, but I'm not sure who's regular, who's not regular, but we have also regular kids in yeshiva. And when you have regular kids in yeshiva, sometimes the other kids create problems for them. That's a problem we all have. But I believe really you can help every, every single child. You can. I want to tell you something about myself for a minute. I want to talk about myself, okay, if you don't mind. Um, I went through a very, very, uh, Rebbe, Avi doesn't know what I'm going to speak about, Avi, Rebbe Avi, I should say, excuse me. He has, by the way, a wonderful son-in-law, Talmud, I wish you to Solomon, terrific, 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 terrific young man. You know that? You know that? It is? Can harab HaShem, B'liyayin harab. Anyways, um, so I was 15 and a half years old, exactly, and then um, I've heard with my father coming up now, 50, over 50 years already. And I was learning in Philadelphia Yeshiva. Philadelphia was Harvard. Philadelphia, there was no out of town Yeshiva. There was Nary Israel in Baltimore. Mostly out of town crowd who came there. And I'm talking about the Litvish world. And um, there was not much more in the Chesidish world then. There was nothing really then. And uh, it, was it was not really for high school boys. Not really for high school. It was a uh, It was not really out of town. It was local Muncie Yeshiva. So there was the two or three main Yeshivas were really, was Cleveland Tells. And then it was, uh, we used to call it the Talzalaga, we used to call it. Because uh, so it was Cleveland, and there was, you know, because they were more strict, or whatever it was, but it was a wonderful yeshiva. Now Israel, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia got into was very chashiv. And I spoke to my father at 10.30 at night. I spoke to my father, and 11 o'clock, he was dead. 11 o'clock, he had a heart attack. It was nifta, I didn't know. So my life changed upside down in two years. And really, I was a shambles for two years. Now, why am I comparing to this? You'll hear me know why. And this is what I try to tell the Bachram that I deal with some of them. Again, I'm not, I'm not the level that Rabavi does. Nowhere near it, of course. 
But I try to tell them this all the time, that I could have given up my life also, and I did for a while. So the next morning, 6.30 in the morning, the Vecker, not only is the Vecker, Shulun Kamenetsky woke me up, who was a very close friend of my father, and he told me, you got to go to New York, your father is sick. But I remember everything vividly of that morning, because you remember these things. He woke me up, and he says, he didn't tell my father was Niftus, I wore film, I davened. Then Rebel Yishvei and Rebbe Him, the two Rashi Yishiva, Adolf Yishiva, they copied me on the train back to New York. In those days, you didn't have cars like that today. And I went back by train to New York. I come into my father's Levaya. I arrived 10 to 1, Levaya was 1 o'clock. And my brother, Rebbe Chaim Epstein, the Chesarek Levracha, he tells me that he holds, I should be home with my mother. I should be home with my mother? Okay. So, Bikitza, I said, fine. Rebbe Chaim Epstein says, I have to find the yeshiva now, right? I have to find the yeshiva. And um, I'm not, I was in Tervidas, and I left high school to Philadelphia. So I was in Tervidas, I'm not going back there now, so I got to find a new yeshiva. So it took about two, three weeks that I was home, and I'm staying home with my mother. My brothers were out of town, I had a sister that was home, and my whole life changed upside down. I'm, I'm in Harvard, goodbye, you're gone, you're going to be home now. I became very, very angry. Now, my mother suffered from me, my mother. My mother was a wonderful, wonderful lady. Those who had her for a teacher here, she was a fabulous woman. She never, ever patched us. That, my mother was my, the reason why, what, if I'm anything today, because of her. My mother never, ever laid a finger on us. She would just say to us, Yanka, I'm disappointed in you. That's it. And it worked. Because she's such a lovely woman that it worked. I'm disappointed in you. But I remember finally, my brother, Rabbi Chaim Epstein, found the yeshiva from Mary Yeshiva. I'm going to give you a, a dogma of how bad it was. So he found the yeshiva in Miri Yeshiva Ocean Parkway because my father was a mirror from Europe, so he knew a lot of people there, and they decided Miri Yeshiva Ocean Parkway. That night, I cried the entire night long. Who I know, Miri Yeshiva? Oh, crazy Miri Yeshiva, anybody. <laughs> my mother who just became a widow, suddenly, we had zero money, by the way. We had no money when my father was living because we just, my father was a Manal in Terbidas, and my mother, job is Yaakov. My mother never asked for a raise in all the years she was in Ms. Yaakov. So when she was Nifter, after 60 years of teaching between Europe and here, my mother was Nifter 23 years ago. Between that, she earned $13,000 at the end, 23 years ago, which even then was nothing. And we had, I don't remember ever getting a shirt. Don't feel bad for me. I don't remember getting a shirt or a pair of slacks that was new. The only thing we got new was a suit for Pesach. I had a cousin, um, I had a cousin that uh, had uh, the first non shatners suit factory in America on the east side, and my mother took us to buy shoes. The only thing, we didn't wear hand-me-downs for shoes. We got a new pair of shoes every year. I remember one time when I was in Terebidas, after my father, my father was Nifta, and I had these hand-me-downs, right? So this was in the past Terebidas, and I forgot to take out the label. The boy's name was Lamb, not the Lambs in Weisberg, and the Lamb thing came out, and a boy sees me. Boys could be cruel, he says to me, Lamb, how you doing, Lamb? I said, I, I gave him a, such a shot with my hand, you know. He made fun of me, because I'm lamb. Here I am, and my father's nishtah. I went to the yeshiva, I cried the entire night long. I finally fell asleep in the morning, and I said, Yankel, time to get up. I went to yeshiva, I went by subway for the next eight years. I went by subway in the morning, and at night today, you wouldn't put your kid on the subway, right? I went by subway every day to yeshiva, but I studied the map. I went to know where I'm going. They used to have a subway map. Today, nothing. I don't know, subway maps today. I had a subway map, and I studied it. I was so exhausted that I fell asleep on the train. And I woke up, I opened up my eyes, and I see the stop says Avon, A V E N. The D train then is changed to F. I said, Avon? I'm lost. Wow. I'm so excited, I'm lost. I'm lost. I have to go to Shiva. And I was, for a minute, I, the first joy I felt in four weeks, because I'm lost. You know, I mean, that's what kids feel like, you know. I'm lost. I don't have to answer to anybody. I'll get stuck somewhere. I'll find out where I am later. The train pulled out of a Avon and pulls into Avenue P. I wasn't lost. <laughs> Avenue N was Avon. There's the E and the N are too close to each other. <laughs> Where's it? 50, 54 years later, 54 years later, I remember the joy I felt, the excitement I felt that I was lost. It lasted for about two and a half minutes as long as it takes from Avon to Avenue P. And next time was King's Highway, I got off the train, I slept the yeshiva. First day, I'm walking in there. No one says, you know, I'm not making my yeshiva, chas v'shalom, my video, I've got to be careful. Eli Brudney, Abba Brudney, my friend from Williamsburg, Rebelli Brudney, and Brudney said, shalom aleichem to me. Hello to me. I walked in there, began a two years of depression. 
I was very down. I was really very down. And I just kept on feeling sorry for myself. Look at you, your life turned over. I, I dwelled on, I couldn't go to my mother. I didn't want to hurt her, my mother. You know, I touched her her. She's a widow. I couldn't go tell her anything. And I, for two years, I'm not exaggerating. I was just very, very down. I couldn't learn. I didn't care. I cut classes. Can't answer to what the Faraka people would throw me on my job. I, I cut classes. I used to buy 50 cents tickets in Yankee Stadium. The bleacher seats. I used to buy I used to 50, imagine the tickets for 50 cents in Yankee Stadium. Sneak out of Yeshiva and go there. I just was not a happy person. I was not at the Freedom of Mensch. You know, I wrote a book about my parents called The Tale of Two Worlds. So when I wrote the book, I'm digging a little bit hoarse. So I wrote this book, A Tale of Two Worlds. I had an author, of course. And I wrote a lot of anecdotes there. A lot of anecdotes there. People think that Gedalim are made, you know, automatically. So I had a lot of stories on Williamsburg. I just spoke to Vision to Chassid. I, anything I remember, they put into the book. I wanted to make the book not just about my parents, about the Tkufas, my mother in Europe, Sari Shnira, my father learning in the mirror in Europe. My father's an American. And Tervidas, he had building Tervidas, and, you know, building Miss Yaakov in America. So anecdotes. So I had some very close friends. I sent them the book, an inscription, okay? There are four Canaric brothers. They run the Peekskill Yeshiva. Uh, wonderful people. One is Rebelia Canaric, he's the Rosh Shiva. You know them, Rabbi? You know, you know them? Okay. Rebelia Canaric is the Rosh Shiva. Rabbi Herschel Canaric is the Manal in high school. Rabbi Beryl Canaric is 12th grade Rabbi. Rabbi Mendel Canaric is the second director. Mendel Canaric is a big let's. He calls me up once. He says, Yanko, we're changing the name of our Mary Peekskill. We're calling it Canaric, 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 and Canaric. So we're changing the name. Because you know, all the Yeshivas. So when I sent him the book, uh, two weeks later, he calls me up. He says, Yanko, I love the book, but I got me very nervous. Once you had all the stories in the book, you had all the stories, then what if you put them there? There's a guy, fellow, he's a ninth grade rebbe. He's, you can do the pin test, whatever it's called. He knows shots all over. He's a, his parents had a television. We grew up in Moisburg. It was very commonplace. We didn't have a television. Imagine today that the police, the secret, will get them today. Uh, uh, everybody had television. I think the television, if you asked me, I don't go for a tangent, was created for the Holocaust survivors. It brought them a little bit of and Efesh. They escaped. The people that came here, they were such, we don't know how, but we saw when we were kids, you know, the 50s, they were so broken. And I remember the old people that we used to go visit them, whatever, they were so broken and they got escaped. The television was, wasn't what it is today. But they really, I think, if the television had a Milo, that was the big Milo television then. These people, see the mostly, you know, because there were very few litter in Poland, no one survived. But the Hungarian Jews survived. I remember the, the was, you couldn't find, they, they had the biggest lesson, by the way, that group. You couldn't find a, a, an Ahmed between Pesach and Shavuz, because all the art sites were there. All the art sites were there, it was terrible. Anyway, so, parents, survivors, they had a television. 1962, eight of us, watched the last game of the World Series. You know what? We didn't turn out so bad. We didn't turn out so bad. Nishke Ferlech. you know. Today, by the way, I use this, you know, I'm being to say this over here now. When people come to me with the computer, I tell them, you're going to take everything away from them. Forget it. You're going to lose them. You can't. The houses that are super strict, not so posh that you should know. And by the end, I try. My my father was a very, I have to say this, but I miss a friendly he was Nizer and everything, and Kashrus and stuff. And when Kashrus was a problem in America, he really was Nizer and everything, my father. I don't remember that much from my father. My, my mother much better, obviously, right? And he allowed us every Sunday night to go watch TV by a neighbor. He allowed us. Now, you can't imagine that today. How could you imagine that today? Because everybody was watching TV. He didn't want us to do it secretly. So when I moved to Farakaway, Farakaway is today is a much firmer town, correct? Different world. And how many years are you there? How many years are in Farakaway? Uh, it was 30 years. So I came 40 years ago. We had to tell our kids you only go on Shabbos till Lawrence. Because Lawrence was a much more modern day. But today, you have all kinds today. You couldn't go past the circle. It's a circular, big circle, traffic circle. You couldn't go past it, right? But every Sunday, we told our kids, go watch TV, go watch the ball games. Because if not, they would have gone, all their friends, everybody had television in those days. They would have gone and watched on their own. So, I remember that. that we, so we used to, I used to cut now. Ellie Bunny was a good boy. He didn't cut class. But I cut class. I was miserable. And I'd say that, forget it. Finally, if the, I'm going to cut short those two years of shenanigans that I did. But I was miserable. I was unhappy. I blamed it on my father that he died. Never had problems on my mother. I blamed it on everybody. I blamed it. Until 
I discovered, so I decided I got to do something. I was busy feeling sorry for myself. When I talked to the Brahmin and Shiva that are going off, right? That, there aren't that many, obviously. We send them to Rabavi, of course. But Lamaisa, I tell them, stop feeling sorry for yourself. That's the thing I find works for me. Feeling sorry for yourself makes you feel good for 10 minutes, but it does nothing for you. You're back where you started from. When a kid takes drugs, he's down in the dumps. It's great. For an hour, it's wonderful, right? Whatever, how would drugs work? And boom, you go down. So I, I discovered myself. And I tell this to the Bachman that I work. I wouldn't mind speaking to the boys, by the way. I really thought that we see some of the boys tonight and girls. But, but I said, don't feel sorry for yourself anymore. It's going to get you nowhere. I had the brains, at least, to think like that. And I, told, and I decided to become a pure leader. I got to do something for others. And I said, I find, by the way, now, I know, again, I'm not here, but Rabbi's class, I did read his books, obviously. And I, he mentions, I find that the greatest thing I can do for these kids is give them a job to help other people. I find many of these kids are mushlical hearts. And, and when you give them a job to help others, they find out there are others that are worse off than them. And I find that to be a fabulous idea. Whenever I have a kid who's broken, he's, he's cheating on Shabbos, I give him a job to help somebody else. And they come away, it's not the high that one gets from a drug, but they get a high. Helping other people. Inherently, people are good. People want to be good. So I, for myself, then this, I did all myself, I had no one to talk to. The other officials, again, I wasn't in the matter like that. I was from, you know, but they didn't exist growing up in Williamsburg. You were either from or you were a guy. You know, that's all it was. So I didn't go in that direction, but I was miserable, unhappy, not to free to myself. So we had Pirche groups in those days. I decided I'm going to become a Pirche leader. And I did. I applied for a job as a Pirche leader. Pirche was Shabbos groups on Shabbos. There was learning groups. And there was those days, it was mostly stories. I became a Pirche leader. And lo and behold, I told stories. I made up stories. I remember at Kalman Kleinimus, I made a group of five boys, learning Tervidas, and they were, they were Hevelite, and they used to make trouble or whatever. I made up, and I started to say, and I found out, look, I could help other people. I was helping these kids, all these kids. I said to myself again and again, you're feeling sorry for yourself, you went through life badly. Everybody here probably feeling sorry for themselves, no? You have pekluch and pekluch and pekluch, right? Some of you have two, three, four, five, you have pekluch and pekluch. I think really that the greatest thing, I'm not saying that you could do, but I find that you could do is go out there and help other people. First of all, it's a schooler. People look for schoolers all the time, right? I'm not telling you to go stand and hold a kachka in one hand and a line in the other hand and do a school with them. I'm not telling you that. A school that you want is that you really, is that you go out and help other people. It worked for me. It worked like magic for me, you know. And I've used it ever since, ever since tell people. And those kids that are problematic, I don't to do that, really. You give them jobs. It works. She's a regular she, but they know a kid can't sit in the class and you give them a job because you want to keep them, you want to keep them out, out of trouble, right? But if I help them, so that started digging me out of my hole. Started digging me out of my hole. I started working, helping other people, and then I went back to learning. Again, see the rest is history. Whatever I am, I am. I'm not. I'm not. But I think that's that's to me that was the key. That don't feel sorry for yourself. It'll take you nowhere. It'll take you nowhere. Everybody has feeling sorry for themselves. No, why me? I want to tell you a story. Um, you have to get a high madriga for this. Not to feel sorry for yourself. The other boy in the she was named Daniel Younger. Daniel Younger is uh, my, one of my heroes. We taken all these handicapped kids to yeshiva. So over the years, we took as many kids, unfortunately, that came from this borough. Why should a handicapped kid have a problem? I don't know. This boy came to yeshiva. He was in, uh, lived in, whatever he lived in. And he came to yeshiva. He ended up moving to the neighborhood. And, and he's in a wheelchair. He knows his matzah. He has a disease called MD, muscular dystrophy. It's a very, very bad disease. Very bad disease. We've had over the years four boys with that disease in Yeshiva, none from Farakaway and Lawrence, all from Kings County. Four boys, two brothers, right, and one boy from one family. Ayla Rabinowitz came from a very beautiful home in Flatbush in Benzenhurst. And the two Minza brothers, the Baba Vachsidim. Two of them are not living anymore. You know that the kids in Yeshiva grew dramatically from having these kids. I tell this to other Menalim all the time. I tell Menalim this all the time. You think taking in a kid to Yeshiva has problems is a taiva for the child? Yes, it certainly is. The biggest taiva for the other kids. 
they learn how to deal with adversity. They help these kids. They, that is the handicap, which is obvious. But even if the Ruach, if in Ruach, in spirit, they have a problem, so what? So Daniel Younger is a superstar kid. Daniel Younger didn't have it easy. Daniel Younger came to Yeshiva, was here one year. He had an uncle that had the same disease. Must get this free. One day, Daniel Younger is not in Yeshiva. His mother calls, he can't be in Yeshiva because his uncle was Nifta. That's a little bit unusual. A boy stops coming to Yeshiva because his uncle is Nifta. You know, I mean, you know, he didn't come to Yeshiva. I found that the uncle had muscular dystrophy. Now, the real younger was nine years old. But the real younger knew he had muscular dystrophy. And his best friend in the world, his uncle, died of the machla that he had. So I got in my car. I, they lived in Brooklyn, right? The father worked in Milmot, I remember. I got in my car and I drove down to see him. I found him in his bed in a pool of tears. I'm not exaggerating one word to you today. The bed was soaked from tears. He couldn't get out of bed. He, you know, he didn't say the words to me, this is my life too, right? He didn't say it to me, but there's a bed soaked with tears. I sat there, I said to him, he promised he'll come to Shiva again. And, he, and, he, and he, I said, use that language. You feel bad? Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Where will it get you? Where's your crying? That's mean on my part? No, I said, I feel bad for you, but where's that going to take you? The fact that you're going to feel sorry for yourself, you're going to cry your head off, is that going to do anything for you? Get up and do something with your life. He's 26 years old today. Right? I told him at one point, I told him, you know, I'm a little bit out of his genes. I told him, get yourself a dog. I thought having a dog for him would be very, very good. <laughs> you know, this is like a little strange for a guy coming, growing up in Mirishi with all the Musa around you. I told him, see, this guy has a dog in the house. You're completely cuckoo, right? You know, but he had a dog, and he learned how to give love to the dog. He has a dog, and he walks the dog. It's terrific. I know the dog very well. I visit the dog. I pick up the dog, I have pictures, picking up the dog. I don't hang up the pictures in the walls of yeshiva, but you know, but, the, but I have, I, he's my friend, the dog is one of my best friends, the dog. But he became a boy that works on himself. He can't move, come on any limb. How could a boy like that be happy? How could he be happy? He knows, he read up on everything. He read up everything about it, what, what it was like. He knows exactly what his matzav is. He knows exactly. And he harvests, he's Mava Sadri now, Chumash and Rashi, Targum with Rashi. And he says to me, you know, I'll learn tar- if I learn Rashi every week, I'm learning Kola Terukula. He learns Musas for him. It takes him 15 minutes to open a safer. He has a little bit of power. He wants to do himself with his fingers. So when he was going through his stages, when he was 17 years old, all right, he was going through his stages of. It used to take me also 15 minutes to open a safer. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody was proud of me. Uh, well. <laughs> Anyways. It took him, he's an unbelievable kid. When he was 18, he went through a little bit of a, there's a yid that one of the Muri she was, she was there with Rabbi Yom and Finkel. If you see this man, he radiates uh, simcha, happiness. They call him Rabbi Yom and Atzadik, there's this role. Rabbi Yom and Atzadik. And I was zaychet to bring him to Yeshiva to speak to the boys. I can't tell you, they, the people want his brachas. They lined up for brachas, everybody, he was there for hours. And then Neil Young is riding by with his, with his electric scooter, you know, with his equipment. <laughs> So, of course, Rashiva Finkel goes down. He says, You should have a full shlema. He was in the age then when he was a little bit like, he says, I didn't ask for Rachel full shlema. I was standing there, I was stunned. I was stunned. And, okay, I said, Daniel, so what do you want? You know, he didn't know English. I said, What do you He says, I want a bracha for your shemaim. So I told him in Yemen, he wants a bracha for your shemaim. So normally you answer, you're a Shemaim, you get it or you don't. They gave you a bracha for that, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta be on your own. But I figured it out, and he didn't deny it to me. By him not denying it to me, is it me that means he's maida. How could a boy growing up in a wheelchair not say, why me? He can't go to the bathroom by himself. The bathroom, by the way, take him to the bathroom. They, excuse me, they wipe him. It's a, it's a great training for a bacha. You know, bacha. If you give these guys jobs, this is what you got to do to them. Let, let them work with other kids. The boys you should take care of them in the bathroom. But everyone's at recess. They're all flying out to get the courts, right? There's a certain amount of basketball courts. They want to get the basketball courts. He, he, he's going to watch. So the boys, when he's young, they played them. Now he can't. Hashem, his parents got him, helped out. He has his own van that works with a computer. He has a little bit of power in his hands. Right? I mean, his hands, he can still move a little bit. 
And he drives the car. No one wants to get in the car. I got in the car. I went, I went for a ride with him. He's a great driver. He drives down to the mountains. And this is, you know, he do things to me. But at that time, I said to myself, it must be that he must say, why me? And it bothered him that he's crutching. Why me? I said, no, is this the reason he didn't deny it to me? And he worked on himself. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, he said, I got, I got, I got to do something with all, all my problems. He has a kid that never is as handicapped as they come. Right? We had three other kids, a boy, Rabinowitz, that came from Benzenhurst, and he was a terrific boy. I think the site is for all of you, all of you. Who am I to talk? First of all, I had eight kids. I have the Leon Hirsch, all of them be well. We all have issues with kids. Not all, much older, et cetera, et cetera. They're married, they don't kids. One kid married off a kid of Eddie Hashem. I'm an old man. Okay. But I think the key is no matter how many kids you have with the issues, we have. I don't know why the shyness I sent to you. I can't answer you. But I'm going to tell you another story now. A true story. Rabbi Reisman used to, used to be the Rabbi Yaguda. He's an right, Rabbi Meredith there, Yaakov Reisman. He has four kids that are very, Nebuchadnezzar has only three now, that are very developmentally delayed. Right? They're not, you know, not well. Two of them work for the Yeshiva all the years. They're assistants in the pre 1A. They're assistants. We give them a fake check, but they. Truth of the matter is, he's really not. He's not. So the truth is, they're not really a help. They could tie a kid's shoes maybe a little bit, but they, you know, it's having like another kid in the class who's. So they're assistants in the pre 1A. We used to have three of them. One of them was Nifta. Meishi Reisman was Nifta. I want to tell you a remarkable story with Yaakov Reisman, a wonderful story. So he sent his kids first school, he sent them to was Chush. Sent Chush. Chush is, a, Chush is now is a higher level of handicap. It's not, but these kids were not, whatever, X Factor, whatever it's called, that's what it's called, the disease that they have. So the first year I went to the Shiva, they asked Rabbi Reisman if it will be the parents of the year at their annual dinner. So he says, yeah. He was the, he was the honoree at their dinner. He was the parents of the year at the, at, the, at the annual dinner. I come to the dinner, and I, I went to the dinner. I said, why can't I give you? He was a good friend of mine. Chizuk, to Rabbi and Rebbe Reisman, come to the dinner. Yanko Reisman, maybe the greatest part of the speech was maybe because, maybe because there was no video and nothing of the speech. No tape, no nothing. So he should have heard the speech. I'll never forget it. He gets up and he says, you know, sitting here today, parents and more parents, maybe grandparents, he says, I don't see any really outsiders here today. I was one of the outsiders, sort of, right? I don't see outsiders here today. I see parents, and everybody here must be thinking, why me? Why do I have one or two or three? He had four kids like that, right? And one more kid's a little bit not so strong. Why me? Now, aren't you all thinking that? They were glued to him. He didn't ask for an answer, but why me? I'll tell you a story. I'll tell them over. This is the famous Shia story. One of the rising kids named Shia. So... I haven't talked about the yeshiva today, and that's not my intention, but this happened because I saw it. When the yeshiva had my son Tzvi was in that class, fifth grade went out to play ball. So Tzvi is now 40 years old. He's got to be about, he was, at the time then, he was about nine years old. So this is a story of 31 years ago. So I was the chief cook and bottle washer. Wasn't I today I'm the fancy head of a school with principals? I, I was the principal, and I was the bus monitor, and I was the, I was the I had to whatever, whatever I had to do. So I go out there and watch the kids playing ball. One of the kids says to Shia, he says to Shia, I didn't tell the story of Ryzen, I didn't want to hurt him. But somebody else told him, one other person saw it. So I said to, uh, so, so he says, right, so I said to Shia, I'm sorry, the kid said to Shia, Shia, you want a bat? And Shia says, yeah. They handed him the bat, he took it upside down the bat. So another boy ran up and straightened him out. You know, the barrel of the bat, he held it from the barrel, you know, so someone turns it over. And, and then he stands up at a plate. And the pitcher was a kid, Rosenberg. Susan Rosenberg, because his son, I remember, it's like everybody was involved. And he goes up and he throws the ball. And Shai, of course, swings and misses. And he throws another ball, and Shai swings and misses. Almost like a philharmonic. Suddenly, all the pieces came into play. The pitcher went two thirds towards home plate. Those of you know baseball. He went, the pitcher went two thirds towards home plate, where the kid is standing there. Two boys went up and they held the bat with him. They held the bat with him. Yeah. And he swung, and he hit a ground ball to third base. Those that don't know baseball, forgive me. Okay, he hit a ground ball to third base. The third baseman let the ball roll, roll between his legs. 
And they're screaming to Shai, run, run, Shai, run. And Shai runs. Shai runs to first base. He goes past first base. Another kid runs out. Shai, no, no, no. Brings him back to first base. It's time to go this way, to second base. Shai did not know anything that he was doing. But the third baseman let the ball go through. So the right fielder picked up the ball and threw it 40 feet over the first baseman's head on purpose. If you know baseball, if you don't, know, I'm sorry. In the meantime, Shia has two boys running with him, and they run to third base. And finally, this other guy finds the ball and throws it back to third base, 40 feet over his head, right? And this is like all the kids. And then Shia runs home, and both teams, both sides, picked up Shia on their shoulders, and Shia won the game. That, that won the game for them, by the way. And they all said, Shia hit a home run. And they were carrying Shia. Shia hit a home run. Beautiful story, no? That's what the kids, that's my editorial before. When you take kids who have issues, you help your kids. So I rise and sit over this story. He says, that's what happened with my kids. And then he said a murder good thing. The Kayach and the Gevura of Rabbi Reisman. He says, how do you know that the other kids were the regular kids? And my kids are not the regular kids. Maybe my kids was, he says to the people sitting here, our kids was sent here for a purpose. You don't know why? Kids that go off the derech, we don't have the genes they have sometimes. I mean, genetic factor. Certain kids went through what they went through and didn't go off. They sent with this shyness to this world. They sent with this shyness to this world. And he says publicly, maybe my four sons and all your kids are the good ones. And the other kids got to learn me dice. And we all have a mission in life. The mission in life is to do something. My kids were sent here to this world to teach me those to the other kids. And the other kids don't develop good meters, they failed. They failed. Kids are selfish by nature. Kids can be you know, busy with themselves, right? How many people who have played baseball dreamt of being up and being a baseball player and being up in the bottom ninth inning in the World Series and hitting the home run if you're a sports fan? You dream when you're a baseball fan, you dream that, right? If you see the sheet, what if I would have been the rebel? Sitting there with all the different colors and the, uh, and the things that he, that he wears, you know, the, the beckages that they wear. Every kid, Chesidah, could dreams of being a Chesidah Rebbe. He says, we, we have our kids here, and you're all here today. And you're all thinking, saying, why me? I said, because maybe my kids were here for a purpose. We don't know, Rabbi say, and ladies. We don't know. Who am I to tell you that? Because I do live it with so many kids. We don't know why our kids have these insanities. For sure, they're wonderful kids who did not have it in them to fight. Whatever the reason was, they couldn't fight. They just couldn't do it. So they fell in. And they're falling, and they're falling, and they're falling, and they're falling. I'll tell you one thing, it's almost a guarantee. I don't know what Rabbi, what Rabbi, what Rabbi Fischel tells you, but I've seen the worst. When the parents love them to pieces, take care of them, most of them come back. It takes a long time sometimes. A lot of years of grief, and the ones who don't come back and stay not from, but they come back as family people, and they're good people, and we don't know after 120 years, we don't know where they're going to be placed after Mishraim, we don't know. We think only the flesh of the people, we don't know. We have no idea where these guys who don't come back, we have no idea if they do good things with their life. Doesn't mean Dafka will be coming from again. Hopefully they will be coming from again. But we don't know. I went through two tough years. Baruch Hashem had the brains to say, Stop feeling sorry for myself. But it was a challenge. It was a challenge for me now. Not the same challenge, obviously, right? We all have different challenges. I have the schuss of going three times a year to three conventions. Yes, I go to the convention, I go to the Sorry, convention, I don't mean those conventions. One is called Samchainu, which is a widow's organization. One is called Sister to sister, which is divorce. Ladies who are divorced. And one is called links, right? Links is for Yisaymais. So the Sabchayim has 500 widows, right? And sister to sister has 500 divorcees, right? When I go there for Shabbos, it's, I'm bringing home the peckle for the whole year. With email today, anybody can get through to you. And they do. And links, Yisaymais, they have their own problems, right? 
I fight with the girl. I'm very close to a lot of Lynx girls. I really, I really am. They call me, they write me. It's, it's time consuming to them. I write them phone calls, you know, but I fight with them. I'm a good example. I don't give in to them and everything. For example, the one thing they hate the most is when their parent gets married again. They can't handle that. Rather, a very hush read that works with them told me that the worst ones are the married ones. Go figure it out. The married ones don't like it. The father marries selfish people. You are married. You can't let your father. Your father is a 52-year-old widower. Or your mother is a 49-year-old widow. What's well, Kate Tichon? They're getting married. It's not the same for me. Two girls said to me once, you know, it's like to walk around, you know, we, we three of us, not some mother from Chicago. We have three of us, the, the men that come. We're at Platinum from Chicago. We go, says, he says, one of the mothers says, you know, the, they can't handle it because they used to walk around in pajamas in the house. Now there's a strange man in the house. I can't walk around like that anymore. I said, for that is a reason why your mother shouldn't be happy anymore? Your mother's entitled to be happy. Now I have a right for them with Chumash. I'm Abba Sedra. I try every week with Chumash and Rashi. It's hard, time-wise. I learn every Rashi. Rashi in this week's parasha. Just remember that this week's parasha says, everybody knows when, when he was, when we over time, no? What? It's still time, no? Yeah, all, all right, yeah. Okay, but kids, uh, so Rashi says a remarkable thing, Rashi says, Everybody knows Eliezer, Ebed Avram, brings Rivka, right? For Yitzchak. We all know that Pasuk because she sees Yitzchak. But he a Yitzchak was Sayach, was Sada. He went out to Davin. And she sees, and she sees Yitzchak and she covers up. But this cause, the Benigna Badekin comes from there. The Benigna Badekin comes that she covered her face before she married Yitzchak. But there's another Pasuk that no one talks about. Yitzchak Ba, Mi Be'er, Lachai Raya. Yitzchak was coming from a city called it means where Ashkarish Baruch who saw the Malach came to Be'er Lachai Ra'i. And then it says he went to Davin and then she saw him and she covered up. So Rashi says, why was he coming? Why was Yitzhak doing Be'er Lachai Ra'i? He didn't live there. Rashi says, he went to arrange for Hagar to marry his father again. He went to arrange a Shidduch for his father. Halach, to ask Hagar to remarry his father. So she was allowed to, Lalacha, because she didn't marry anybody else. And she went back and she had more kids with Avraham Avinu. So, who was the Shatcha there? Yitzchak, the son. I told the girls. Yeah, but Yitzchak was getting married already. I'm single. Said, blow only me alone, you girls. Come me alone. Blow me alone, you lumbish or trutzim. The Torah says, everything of gracious is to teach us lessons. Everything. Look what Yitzchak does. My Rebbe, Shrobelsky, was the one who hammered this into us. He used to say, look what Yitzchak does to save Esau. Esau, unfortunately, was destined to be the head of Adam and Amalek. Right? He does it. What shot over there? Yitzchak ate, right? Yitzchak is Sayyid, and Yitzchak loved him, Kitzayid Befiv. Why? He gave him a steak sandwich. Yitzchak needed a steak sandwich from, 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 from Esau. No! Yeah, I'm sure Abi says this. Yitzchak says this in the book. He says it. I, no question about it. You know, you, know, you know why he was doing that? My son is not going to talk learning to me. He's going to talk with me steak. I'm going to talk steak to him. That's, of course. Yitzchak, Yitzchak is guru. Yitzchak is tefillah. Yitzchak is the one who went on to the Akeda. The Akeda is Yitzchak, Barachat, and Tizkar. Every time something happened to Klai Yitzchak, Yitzchak remembers the Akeda. He's busy with sushi? Yitzchak, if you don't need sushi, and he used to have a steak sandwich? No, he had a son that he didn't give up on him. He didn't know what Rivka knew. Rivka knew, actually, as Rivka was in the Via, and she knew that Esau ain't ever coming back. Yitzchak, when he's dying, he says, go out there. I want to give you a bracha. Go out there, shech the animal, bring me a geshmaka meal. Next week's parasha. What? Yitzchak? Yitzchak tried till the day he was nifted to bring Esau back. She didn't know. Babish too. The there a tiny Yitzchak that Esau went off? Certainly not. We don't know. We don't know why we have challenges. We don't know. It says Rabbi Rising publicly. I don't know why I have these four kids, but I'll tell you one thing. I want to tell you something interesting. I keep a lot of names in my siddha. People to daven. People call me up daven for people. I have a list of shidduchim, girls that need shidduchim. There are a lot of them out there, unfortunately. I have chaylem. I mean, I mean childless couples, but me is a very big thing. A list of those people over there. And, and you know, I, I keep my siddha. I have a card that holds it safe. If you ever saw it, what I'm holding, you'll see the card, like a, one of these thick index cards, a yellow card. And I have the card. And... It's all worn out. There was some writing there. <coughs> I never gave it out. It's 25 years old. You know why? Because Ray Risen had arranged that his kids should lay in Kriyashma 
every single day in yeshiva and say brachas. When they didn't go, Shabbos, he took care of them. It was a sight to see. They come to shul with their father, say brachas out loud. And one time they came, and the person in charge didn't say Kriyashma with them. He wrote me a note. Uh, I, you didn't make sure my kids, they have one mitzvah to do, he says to me. They were able to say brachas with me. And he, I took that card, I left it in my siddha. Remind me of a lesson that I learned from the Zerizen. Zerizen. That card is still in my siddha, it's worn out. It's completely worn out, that card. I can still see some of the words there. Because when he shakes me out, we were good friends. He gave me a what for, boy. But I want to remember that, that there are people out there, we don't know why, what, when, where. Rise Reisen looked at it, Abish just sent me in a sign. Two heroes, him and his Robinson. And we're going to take care of it. You have to look at it as a sign. And why me? Why do you have that in sign? First of all, if you only know how many, the ones with Seichel are here tonight. The ones who understand this, and I'll be official if I can work with you. Baruch Hashem. Okay, but I mean, mother out there, come on. Who are you kidding? There's no why me's. We don't know anything in life exactly. Our job is to work with them. Shouldn't every yeshiva? There's not a yeshiva day over here now. They should, but not everybody's really capable of doing it. Not everybody's capable of doing it. You've got to try your best with every single kid. I try to stay in touch with all these kids. I met a lady on the way in. I hadn't spoken to her son for a long time. He learned best in yeshiva. I called him last week. Right, I called him. I spoke to him for a while. I spoke to him for a while last week. I try to stay in touch. You need time for that. I have a problem with time. It's a very big yeshiva, and you just don't have enough time. And, um, but I'm just saying to all of you, my heart goes out to you. You're suffering. And I know what the suffering well, Which mother doesn't suffer for a child? Which father doesn't suffer? But you should know. Abe's to send you an sign. You do your job, that's all you got to do. You do your job, it's not to see in this world as far. How do my, my father, you know, you, you think when you're a little kid, my father wanted to finish Shas, me, and he didn't finish. You know, when you're a kid, you think like that, right? You couldn't finish me, and maybe you learned yourself this, and he never finished. It's my problem to worry about that. I'm sure Shem takes care of it. If he, he learned by some other rabbi, I'm sure we all will finish us in another world. You know, there's a there's Gemara Sanhedrin that says, the Kaddish Baruch Hu says, three Mishmaris in the night. Four hours for us. For us. The middle, what does the Kaddish Baruch Hu do during those three Mishmaris? What does he do? He's pretty busy, Hashem, no? What does he do? What does he do? He says, in the middle of Mishmaris, you know what he does? He learns with the kids who died young. So, tell that to a parent who lost a child. Well, it's not anything worse than burying a child. Pretty bad, right? I'm sorry if anybody here lost a child, forgive me. It's, it's pretty bad, right? Losing a child is a shver azach. Maybe Hashem, Chavrusa, we should look well, you and I, none of our children should do anything to happen. But, we don't know the Chajbanis. I'm saying that to all of you over here. You latch on to a man like, I'm not trying to flatter him, patronize him. There's no reason not to patronize him, I don't. But you latch on to somebody good that knows the stuff, and eventually you'll see the Paris. It might take 20 years. It might take 10 years. There's some of you that are sitting here that I know well that I've had nothing but aggravation for a very, very long time. <coughs> Who knows? We know the reason for it. I say, Yasha just keep on, and the best thing you can do is go out and find somebody else. I'm saying, not Tafka here. Help other people. When you help other people, you feel a sense of accomplishment. You know, it worked for me. When I went through those two bad years, all right, you say two years, big spiel. It was two hard years. And when you're a teenager, those years, 15, 16 years old, not a great age to be off the wall, off the charts. You know, my mother dealt with me. She was wonderful. Never got, never got angry with me. They got upset with me. Never, never, never. And I was really, I remember one time, I wanted to play the frum roll one time. So my mother's very ready for Pesach. She used to cook a pot of gefilte fish. That was a huge pot. And I saw, yeah, I had to make it. I looked at the wall, wallpaper in the olden days. It was made out of, uh, the paste was made out of, of wheat. Remember those wallpaper, the paste? I said, Ma, look up there, Ma. This paste coming out, it's Pesach. I climbed up there before she had a chance to even breathe. I started wiping it out right into the fish pot. <laughs> I thought my mother would, Yankel, that's the fish for Pesach. You know, I remember today, a huge pot. It finished, it's gone. All right, okay, don't worry, but you know, yeah, why'd you do it for? I'm disappointed in you. You remember these things in your head, you know? I, went to the, I did all kinds of things. Well, my sir, I'm here today, and you're all here today. And you got to do all you got. Our job, Yiddish, is say, Ich darf tin. The Eibishter with Eiftin. Eiftin means, you got to do, and Hashem will make it happen at the end. 
That's his job. Shmatzliach. Rabbi Bender, thank you for coming. It shows us that the leaders of Klal Yisrael care about us, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.